We are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams. Hey guys, it is Tristan with Nerdut's newsstand, and I am so excited! I am so excited. <laughs> I'm Jeffrey Thorne. I haven't been able to do the, and ask the experts in so long. And I want to thank you. I have been looking forward to this all week. I cannot wait to be able to talk a little nerd. I'm not going to lie. Oh, yeah. You know what? Forward. I love it. I love this crap. I love it. I do too. And don't get me wrong. I like the other stuff. But come on. This is my passion. <laughs> yeah, this is where like it's at. Yeah, and you know what? It. I, I got I to gotta start off by apologizing. For? So, a while back, and we're gonna okay. go right into Hal Jordan. You you oh, had Lord. to know. <laughs> no, I didn't. What did you do? What are you? I, I was like, for? well, you know that when the original article, when you, before you even started writing Green Lantern, right? Oh, that, Rich Johnson's yeah. like, dun, 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 gotta write an article, and oh, um, God bless Rich. Oh, and oh, I was did like, you say oh something my harsh? God. I said something a little harsh. You won't ever find oh, it now, though. No, I'm not looking <laughs> for it. I'm absolutely no, I privatized it. it. After your oh, interview okay. with Perch, I did privatize it, and I actually made it a video. I was like, I was an asshat. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm what? sorry. No, no. Well, first of all, that's what misinformation is meant to do. Right. And it is a, what do I say this? How do I say this right? A good person, a decent person, a regular person, a human person goes, oh, shit, I made a mistake. And course corrects. They don't double down. They don't go, let me look for more crap. They're like, oh, wow, I didn't have all the data. Now I've got more data. It's time to revise. Right. That's how I try to be. I don't hold anything against anybody because what data did they have at that time? I hold a lot against Rich. But, um, <laughs> well, it's a, it's a trick Mr. Johnson has pulled at least one other time. And uh, it cost my friend Dwayne McDuffie a job. So um, oh back before. Oh, you guys don't know this, because see? No. Yeah. All right. So let's get into it if you want to get into it. Ah, I um, love it. Okay. So back before there was such a thing as the uh, website that shall not be named, um, there was this dude named Rich Johnson. And there was this other dude named Dwayne McDuffie who had come off of doing all this great cartoon stuff, Ben 10, Justice League, The Static right. Show. He, he was sort of becoming a big deal. And he wanted to do Justice League. DC wanted him to do Justice League. They were doing a sort of a, I won't say exact synergy, but they kind of wanted the cartoon, which was doing really, really well, to visually match up with what the Justice League book looked like. And since there's so many Justice Leaguers at that point, it was an easy thing to do, and Dwayne wanted to do it. But because of the way the backstage of it all, like editorial was doing stuff, and he was getting weird... Um, last minute changes like wait what but you said i could use this character we've written like four issues with this character oh as the gosh. lead you know and no somebody else wants him or her or no the company doesn't want to use that character anymore so you're going to have to quickly before we go to um print rescript all of these things and you've got overnight to do it or you've got over the weekend to do it or that arc that we all wow. agreed to three months that i'm building up to yeah we're scrapping that you have to do something else so this was what was going on, and Dwayne was a professional, and he um, just pivoted because that's the job. It's like it's not ha you're not happy about it, but there's not much you can do about it, so you have to come right. up with cool, creative solutions, and that's what he did. But unfortunately for Dwayne, <laughs> um, he had um, his own sort of website uh, forums devoted to him, and one of the things was sort of an AMA type deal, like ask me anything mm -hmm. about the shows or comics I've done, anything you want, right? And he was always kind and polite, but always straightforward and always truthful. So someone would say, hey, how come X happened? Or how come this delay occurred? Or what? Didn't it look like it was building up to this guy being the killer? How come it's this chick over here? Right? Stuff like that. And Dwayne would say, yeah. oh, well, that was because at the last minute, editorial asked me to make a change. Or that was delayed because blah, 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 blah. Never in a defensive way. Never in a, it's not my fault. He wasn't that dude. He would just answer your question truthfully right so this oh, went no. on for right so this went on for a couple of years okay and then this freelance reporter named rich johnson took all of the responses that he had ever given over a year and a half period posted them in an article as if it was a rant of Dwayne mcduffie saying how screwed up editorial was 
and Dan Didio was this, and this other editor was that, and all this other stuff, which was not true. And it certainly wasn't the context of what these one word, two sentences, you know, calm, regular responses were. Oh my to, God. To simple fan questions, right? He's providing access to his fans and he's giving them as much straight data as he can give them so they understand how the business works and everybody can relax. This guy basically did to me what was done to Dwayne, except Dwayne lost his job. Dwayne was fired oh off God. Justice League because you don't really embarrass all senior editorial um, publicly that way and have them just go, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it. Um, and that bugged me because, like I said, that wasn't what Dwayne said or meant. And it was couched in a way that made everybody burn up. God knows what it would have been like now, because this was still, you know, what, almost a decade ago? So right. there wasn't a big internet back then. It was big, but it wasn't like crazy like it is now. So, but it cost him a job. And I was like, wow, dude, you just cost somebody a job. You don't know what his life is. You don't know what whether that was the job he needed. You know, you oh don't know anything gosh. about this guy's life, but you were perfectly fine doing something that you could predict would cost him his job. And it did. So when he tried that crap with me, I got out in front of it. I said, here's what's going to happen. Here's what actually was occurred. All of these little tweets that you guys stacked up. That was basically one tweet a month. Every, well, no, one tweet every three or four months for four years prior to me getting this job. <laughs> When I was just one more fan talking to other fans. I also hate the Snyder Cut. Come no, to me. Same. Like, I don't <laughs> care. Right? Like, I, I was a fan. Any book I'm not writing myself makes me just one more fan. So, um, and he tried that crap with me. And I was like, you're not costing me a job, homie. Um, I'm just going to tell people what the truth is. So I did. And I kept my job. Nobody fired me. And we got to do the book we wanted to do. Um, yeah. Um, so. How did he have... What kind of this kind of puts me in the mindset of why did you have all of that? Uh, like, I don't know. People dig in. Like when they announced that I was doing it, I think no one, most people had never heard of me. You know, like in comics, certainly very few people would know my name. I'd only done Mosaic and Solo um, right. for Marvel, and neither of them were hit. <laughs> Solo was like dead as soon as it was made. <laughs> but um, uh, so people did deep dives. I don't think Rich himself did the first research. I think some Twitter person just went into my feed and put in Jeff Thorne plus Green Lantern or Jeff Thorne plus Hal Jordan or whatever the hell right. and came back with all these things and then passed it on or posted it and Rich saw that. I don't know, but I'm certainly not uh, ashamed of an opinion that billions, right. like, thousands of people hold, you know, and I said, look, I'm a professional writer. Um, my personal feelings have nothing to do with how I execute when someone's paying me to write characters I don't own. Like, relax, kids. It's not going to be like that. <laughs> you know? so, yeah, and yeah. that's crazy to me because um, I I initially, it was, the, the, the article was framed in a way to make you angry. Mm -hmm. And it, and it, and I was like, okay, you know, we're getting this new Green Lantern run. I'm excited. I'm like, can't be real and the more i sat with it the more i realized <laughs> that's no because way. it yeah and yeah i just um after reading your grand lantern even before yeah. i owed the apology but after reading it i am even more impressed because i went into it knowing you know how jordan's not your favorite lantern but it never mm -hmm. felt like that of course never not once. that's not that's not my job yeah <laughs> like, I, I get it now you know, like if you want me to roast Hal Jordan when I'm not working on Green Lantern, I'm back to just being a fan. I'd give you an hour roasting Hal Jordan. But that's just Jeff as a fan reading comics. And there'll be people who argue with me. You know, there are plenty of people who are like, what do you think, John? Uh, what is uh, Hal's made out of cardboard? What the hell is John made out of if Hal's cardboard? And you love John so much. I'm like, look, guys, everybody has their favorites. It, me liking one more than another doesn't mean I'm telling you you're stupid for liking the one you like, right? I'm not insulting you by having a different exactly. opinion in this way. So it was amusing at first, and then I started getting um, pretty aggressive people uh, coming at me on Twitter, which I'd seen had happened to other people. I'm not really built like the other creators that have been sort of driven out of social media by this crap. I'm like, hey, I'm easy to find if you want me. Um, but talking is cheap, so I don't worry about that. I got a couple of death threats, um, and oh one of those, I, it's just crazy stuff. And I was like, dude, seek help, man. 
this is crazy. It's a comic book character. The worst case that the worst case scenario, I stay on the book for a couple of years and you ignore me. And then I go away and you get everything you like back. Like, why is why are you so hyped up? <laughs> like, so, but blah, blah, blah. None of that matters. We came to have a good time with the book. We did. Um, the artists were great. I had a good time. We got through this entire first arc. My contract is over, but that doesn't mean the book's canceled. It just means That's DC right. has re up my contract. Like, there it's still up to them. <laughs> yeah, and who, well, stop it. But who knows? I honestly, I honestly don't know what's on the other side of Dark Crisis. So um, Dark Crisis was as much a surprise to me as it was to the audience. I just oh wow really, really? Asked, yeah, I found out the same way you did on Twitter. They made oh an my and goodness! I was like, "Death of the Justice Dark." What the hell is this? <laughs> wait, wait, wait! So how does that affect? Well, it's interesting. <laughs> because, uh, well, I don't look. How do I say this right? I check in with when I was doing. Um, since we're talking about this, uh, there are points in the story for the last year that we were on Green Lantern um, that. I wanted to use certain characters. So I would mm -hmm. check with the people who were driving those characters, like Tom Taylor. I'm like, hey, I might want to use John Kent. What's what's the plan for John Kent? Right? It would it pop be possible for me to bring him to Oa for any period of time? And he was like, I don't know, cool, but maybe there may be a gap in what I'm doing where you could plausibly bring him to Oa. Now right. he didn't tell me any of the details of what he was doing with John Kent, but there was a little bit of dialogue about that. Same thing with Bendis. I was like, I don't know you, but I'm on Green Lantern right now. You did all this crazy stuff with the United Planets. Um, I'm using that. What's the deal with the United Planets Brigade? Do you have, you know, are you going to kill them in Justice League? Are they going to be villains? Like all of that kind of crap, which I consider to be sort of due diligence. Like one, right. you don't want to step on, you don't want to step on their toes. You don't want to do something ridiculous that's out of character, but you also want to make sure there's at least some kind of coordination, especially amongst the cosmic books where people are out in space doing stuff. You know, um, yeah. but that's that's just the way I am. Uh, my editors were very good about making sure I didn't cross lines when there were things I wanted to do. That they're like, you're not doing that. You better get a grip, <laughs> you know, and um, oh my. and so, so it wasn't that hard on our level because we were way out in front of anything that might happen. Um, what I think was is that often the big world, because I'm not part of the big conversations, they're like, so what are we going to do? We're finishing up Infinite Frontier. What's next? Right, like Infinite Frontier was going to run its course, right, and then something was going to happen at the end yeah. of it, and the people who were involved in that something all got together and made their decisions and started implementing. But I wasn't part of that team. My contract did not extend into that, so right. there was no reason to make me aware. Um, and since my plans for John theoretically took him off the board for right. anything big. Um, there might have been, and I don't know, but there might have been like, well, John's not, you know, he's not going to be here. So <laughs> don't worry about it, you know? And then, of course, like, well, we want to use John for whatever reason. So then they came back at the end and they were like, so what is the status of John Stewart? And I'm like, well, remember that, that arc that no one ever talks about where he got ascended to Guardian stuff? <laughs> and you guys all forgot about that for 25 years? Well, he kind of completed that journey in this <laughs> year. So, they're like, That's what? It's <laughs> like, yeah. So he's kind of new god level uh, power set right now. Yeah. Um, you, they're like, okay, cool. So we got uh, Tom's designs were sent over, and I have no knowledge of what the details are of Death of Justice League or what the hell Dark Crisis is now. So is he going to die? Is he going to, you know, are, are they truly going to be erased or replaced or whatever? No clue. Um, well, I think I we all say, know that. <laughs> well, as right, I know. Fans, we all know <laughs> that. Are we going to kill the Justice League? I wonder, you know. So, uh, but one of the one of the writers, and I can't say who, will be doing something with John in that storyline. And we had a very nice talk. He was he did what I did. He contacted me. He wanted to see one hundred percent of the stuff we did in Green Lantern. All those sort of stuff with John's personality mm -hmm. and character. So I don't know what that will be, but he definitely took the info and he's a really good writer. When you see who it is, you'll be like, oh yeah, okay, I'm confident. And then um, I'm as excited as you guys to see what's done with it. Whatever is done with it, if they want to re-up me, we got two more arcs to tell that should not be affected by anything that they do. Um, oh, even if you had a, another crisis, 
those arcs would not be affected. So, oh, wow. um, well, I've been here a minute and I was trying to, yeah. protect John. <laughs> so, um, so, but again, that is not me saying that's definitely happening. All I'm saying is it's in DC's court and I truly do not know. It's like a black hole. I have no idea what's on the other side. Of, well, of here's the hope in, and you know what? Your stuff with Bendis and the United Planets, nobody would have, like, okay, I, I let every, you know, three issues or so, I read Justice League, and I read it kind of um, back to back. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it just, um, Bendis gets a little long-winded for me sometimes. <laughs> I, 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 no, no, no offense, Bendis, I'm not saying you're a bad writer, but I, I let about three issues pile up and I read them, and um, sure. You, you never you you never felt like there wasn't any good synergy between the the story the cosmic storylines with the United Planets and stuff. You always felt that yeah I, everything we that interacted well. We did that yeah. on purpose, and um, you know again, it's not my job to worry about whether some fans hate Brian Michael Bendis or some of them love him. Right. All all I'm concerned with is the canon. What is actually true. And what is happening now? Like, does he have giant plans for this? Or does it, was it just something he was doing, right? And he was basically like, no, it's just something we set up. And I'm really more focused on Legion of, the Legion of Superheroes end of it and the sort of gold lantern thing. And right. I was like, well, that's got nothing to do with what I'm dealing with. But I can use these guys and the politics of the United Planets. That's very interesting to me. Right. Especially since we're blowing up the power battery and now the Green Lanterns don't have the, the sort of clout that they that they traditionally should have right at the wrong time, right? You're being asked to join the UN, the United States, but suddenly your nuclear arsenal is empty. Like, yeah. What? <laughs> so it was fun, and, and I I think I think um he was gracious, and uh, we did everything we could to keep our treatment of his stuff consistent. I wish I could have used John Kent, but we just couldn't make it work with what was going on in the book. I couldn't really see a way to have him break off. Right. From what was going on with him, and just that sort of, hey, really let me take cool, this. Though. I think so. Um, and I would talk about using Clark, but he was off on World World, and that was like right. no, no chance, can't do that. So yeah, that one wouldn't um, make sense at all. That the light, the act comics has been phenomenal, but it wouldn't make sense. Holy crap! Right? Like holy <laughs> crap! Jesus, that, that book is awesome. Every um, single yeah. time I pick it up, ever since that he did that like walk between the dead bodies, I'm like, this is going to yeah. be one of those in 20 years we are still talking about. Yeah, people are going to be talking about that. Right. And what's really weird is like you talk about it, a couple of other people that I've seen talk about it, but it is getting nowhere near the buzz it deserves. I think. Oh, yeah. Is right, there's going to be like this delayed, like, holy shit. Like maybe when all the trades are out or something. I don't know. But people are going to discover it and think they were stupid for not reading it when it was out. Oh, completely! It is dope. It is. It is the goods. And then the like, art paired with it. That oh, oh god, geez, <laughs> it's so it's, oh, so it's good. ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And, and, but it's fun too. Like th that's another thing about it. It's still a Superman story. It's got all the stuff, the bells and whistles, and it's 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 just great. It's fun comics. I like it. Like it's easy to like. And it's got Midnighter. Who doesn't love Midnighter? I mean, I know, I know, and and used well, by the way. Exactly, like, I it's you know. so good. One so, thing yeah. I wanted. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go on. You ask. It's your show. I'm, I'm okay. I I have to ask the end. I I mean, obviously, if you've made it this far in the video, you know spoilers. So, um, mm -hmm. the um source, the yes. reveal. I, I just <laughs> gotta say how much I love that. Like, okay. I the moment I seen it, I was like, one of those chills moments. Like, how did I not think of, how did anyone not think of that yet? It's so good. Well, Mark Wade did a version of it in Marvel Comics. Right. Alan Moore did it, God, 20 years ago, more, in Image Comics. And you're right. But I was using, okay, this is kind of a scoop. I'm going to be putting this in the annotations that I do for the book up on my oh, Patreon I love site it. for free. The, the everything I do for DC that relates to DC is free because I don't feel it's fair for me to make money off of something I don't own in that way. So if you ever go to my Patreon, all the Green Lantern related stuff is there to look at for free. But this was the whole thing with the source being Jack Kirby. Yes, everyone knows me knows I love Jack Kirby deeply. He is my he is my lord and master, Jack Kirby. But um, but he actually wasn't meant to occupy that position until editorial told me that I couldn't use. A particular set of characters in the story because they were so completely locked down um which is 
I wanted to use Destiny of the Endless. Oh and my gosh. Yes. Oh and my gosh, a, you're kidding wait. me. That is so cool. Okay, you will you will love this. And again, this is going to go into the annotation, so I'm not blowing anything up, but I guess it's a scoop because I've never told anybody this. The only people who know this would be editorial at DC. So all the cosmic crap that was happening, the, the character Lonar shows up. So instead of going back in time the way we did in the book, where we go back to the actual battle, Lonar takes John to Destiny's Garden. Oh my gosh. Right? And so the whole thing was, we're running around Destiny's Garden while Lonar sort of cryptically tries to explain what's going on and avoid Destiny, who's walking around in the garden. <laughs> Right. So, but the the thing was fun was that you can't how you avoid it. You can't avoid destiny. He right. knows you're there. <laughs> right. So that was the whole thing. And then John would have made a mistake that would cause him to get blasted by God energy. And then and then destiny would be like, okay, now it's time. For, this is the time when you guys go back to regular space. Wait, what? Boop, back in regular space. Oh so, my gosh! But, I wonder if it's because of nightmare country. It's all because the. The, the, the Sandman universe is locked down by Neil Gaiman. We had a long discussion about it, and I said, well, wait. And he, Neil, first of all, I don't know Neil. I have no knowledge of Neil. I'm sure he's a lovely person. Uh, and this was in no way a tack on Neil at all. But even he would say, of all of the Endless, Destiny is the one he did not invent. Destiny predates the Endless. Destiny existed in DC Comics before Neil Gaiman showed up. Right. He just grabbed him and said he's the oldest of the Endless. Right. So I was like, I'm not going to do anything that's going to affect any of that. Nothing happens here is going to do anything to the Neil Gaiman verse. And it technically isn't something he owns to say yes or no to. Right. And they were like, are you high? It's Neil Gaiman. <laughs> we're not doing that. You're not doing any of that, Mr. Thorne. So just give it up. And I was like, okay, oh, my so gosh. What, right. So what can we do? And what we could do is what you saw. So um, so that's one of those things that happens backstage where you want to do something and for a billion reasons you can't and you still have to tell the same plot. That's what we slid into that slot. So, um, and it was kind of fun to see the young new gods. I got to see um, Darkseid's mom as a mm -hmm. young woman rather than the old hag that she's always portrayed as. And people who know that lore at all, if you go back and look at those comic, at that comic, that particular comic, there are a lot of characters in there who we did not name but are Kirby New Gods, right? Oh, now um, I gotta go look back. Like Orion's mom is there. Um, young Granny Goodness is there. Um, God, uh, uh, young non Dark Side Dark Side is there, but pre Dark Side Dark Side is obviously right. there. Um, and the one character, John Byrne or Walt Simonson, I can't remember, created who is Viking the Black's mom. She's there. Like, we do a lot of visual crap in that book that if you know, if you don't know the lore, so what? Just a bunch of random new gods having a fight. But if you do know the lore, you'd be like, wait, didn't she only appear in issue five? Holy crap. You know? That's a deep cut. Yeah. All, there's nothing but deep cuts in this book. Like nothing but deep cuts. Oh, I know. there was deep cuts throughout the entirety, but I didn't like, I, I, I would guess would call myself, um, I don't know. I know enough about comics to get my way around. Sure. I didn't sure. even notice some of those things, but like, I'm still on the destiny thing. Like, I don't <laughs> know. I know Neil Gaiman is very, very rigid with those characters. Like to the point where I think it was Bendis got in trouble for mm -hmm. having death. And yeah. I, I, I was, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm never a person who's trying to burn down a fence. I of just, course. I just assumed the rule was everything he created, he owns, which is fine with me. But this destiny thing seemed like a loophole. And they were like, there are no loopholes. Stop talking. So, <laughs> there are no uh, loopholes. It's Neil Gaiman. <laughs> it's Neil Gaiman. What part of Neil Gaiman are you not understanding? Like, so, so, so I was like, oh, man. And then I, even after I had written the script the other way, I'm like, are you sure? And they were like, yes, we're sure. Just give us the script, you idiot. So, oh, my gosh. That's, um, that so would, that's fine. It's official headcanon now, though. Yeah. I mean, that would have been so <laughs> cool. And I could, anyway, whatever. And I try to get all of Cosmic DC at least mentioned, if not shown, in the course of this book. Um, and it, even to the point where the bit where Lonar is explaining um, to John, look, here's how it works. There was the source, and then there were these things, and there were these things, and there were these things. There was a line about there was the source, then there was the endless, first of the endless destiny, and then the universe kept going, right? That line had to be taken out. Oh, so, my gosh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So what a shame. But, That's so that is amazing though. Like just from a fan standpoint, I, <laughs> I I I remember the you know the Jack Kirby stuff with Fantastic Four and it was really cool to see this one. But like 
I'm a, such a big Neil Gaiman fan in general. Like, just yeah. that idea to me is amazing. And then, like, Nightmare Country just came out, you know, with the right. Corinthian and stuff. Right, now right. I'm going in my head already theorizing, like, are we going to see? This is Corinthian number two, right? Because he wiped out the original Corinthian right. and then recreated it. So we've right. never met this guy, really. That's not true. Much. It's going to be really fun. It's going to be so good. Tinian does such a good job at the uh, horror aspect. Mm -hmm. And, oh, my gosh, the first issue, I'm like, everybody read this. Just just go support <laughs> it. Go do it right now. This is why I like your channel, though. This is this is um, you. You're definitely you're in it in the right way to me. You're here for the fun parts, even when you're critical. So, like, your criticism doesn't come out of dislike. It comes out of I want to have more fun. And, <laughs> You know, that's oh, thank you. So, that yeah, means a bunch. So, so I so, want to yeah. shift gears a little bit. We got to talk okay. a little bit about Blood Syndicate. And I know oh, you probably yes. can't say a whole bunch. I don't know what you can say, but so how did you end anything. up? Ah, okay. How did you end up getting that? Because I actually, the funny thing is, is, I didn't know you were writing that. I didn't see an announcement. So I'm doing my DC solicitations video. Like, and I'm like, what? oh, Blood <laughs> Syndicate. And I'm like, Jeffrey Thorne. I'm like, yes, this is going to be good. Like my well... <laughs> enthusiasm restored. I don't know how this worked out exactly. I'm sure they talked to a bunch of other people while they were talking to me. But I've made it clear if there was ever a Milestone 2.0 that whoever was in charge of Milestone 2.0 better let me have the blood syndicate or somebody's <laughs> going to be on the news that night. But in real terms, I was just an approach. I was working on Green Lantern. Um, Reggie Hudlin and uh, uh, Dennis Cowan and the editor um, sort of sent me an email like, do you want to pitch on this? And I was like, what are you, stupid? <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Right. And they were like, do you have a pitch? I'm like, why are you talking? Would you like to hear the pitch now? Because I've got it for you. Right. And they're like, are you ready to pitch it right now? I'm like, I've been waiting 20 years. Yes, I have the pitch right now. So I did. And they were like, wow, that's kind of dope. Right. And I was like, well, awesome. I don't know exactly what all your plans are. How does this all fit in? So there were some things that had to be finessed and moved around. Um, Milestone 2.0 is not a repeat of Milestone 1.0. It's right. a reboot. So there were a bunch of things that were true in the 90s that are differently true now. Right. So, we have so to what you're saying is it's going to be woke. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. I, I'm totally woke. kidding. Oh, my ah! God. Well, I just well, know it's it coming. I just know. Look, they're going to yell at me about that. People have tried very hard to make Green Lantern seem like it was whatever. Oh, God. Was. And I'm like, look, um, this is a story about the people it's about. Um, if you do your due diligence and go and look at the original milestone, the original Blood Syndicate had the introduction of the first out lesbian couple superheroes. It mm -hmm. had the first trans man, um, that Mas is female to male trans. Masquerade, right? Masquerade. Yep. It had a lead character. The leader of the group is a gay man. Um, uh, yep. It's difficult for me to even attempt to do the Blood Syndicate now and not, like, if you suddenly went, well, who, whoever was gay then is gay now. Let's put it like that. Okay. Whoever, mm -hmm. whoever, was, whoever was not straight then in the original is currently not straight. How weird is that? So if uh, that means that someone wants to call me, quote unquote, woke, that just tells me they didn't look at the original milestone. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I dismiss all that nonsense anyway. If it feels truthful, that's all that matters. Do these people feel like people, aside from the superpowers, do they feel authentic? If they do, no problem. If they don't, that's just poor writing. It doesn't matter whether it's woke, quote unquote, right. or not. Right. I think... A lot of that yelling has to do with, and I'm not singling out a particular writer or any of that kind of nonsense. I'm saying if a story didn't reach you, a story if a story reaches you, then you don't have space to call it woke. There's no space in your head for that political right. crap to fall in because you got pulled into the story. But again, you like Sandman. You like the Neil Gaiman approach to comics. That shit was woke as fuck. Oh, back, my God. Back before that was even a term, Right. Um, but if he were to start it cold now, he'd be getting yelled at for having so many gay characters for, yep. for, for, for having so many, I shouldn't say gay, I should have so many queer characters, right? Cause he was running and non-binary uh, non non before it was a thing, right? Polyamory, all kinds of stuff because yep. it was just part of the story and it wasn't a deal. 
right? He was just writing. And I think the climate is different now, but a good writer does not care. You're just writing the story you're writing. And yep. I think there is a loud contingent in the audience. I want to say this properly because I'm so sick of sound bites. I, um, I get it. You know what I mean? Okay. When you like something, you tend to be quiet about it. You're like, oh, that's normal. I like it. I'm happy. The reason you squawk is because something went wrong. So right. by that means most of the responses that you see publicly to anything are people saying why they did not like X, right? So it can get in your head like, oh, everybody hates this thing. And I'm like, no, everybody talking hates this thing. Right. That's not the same thing. So um, woke, not woke. Personally, I don't care. Read the book. Don't read the book. If you like it, great. If you don't, sorry, keep moving. Like, just like I do with all the comics I don't read. Like, there. if you go to shop, how many comics are on the wall? Yes. Right? Are you buying all of them? Nope. Why not? Because I don't like that kind of story. I'm not buying that kind of story. That's the deal. That's the whole deal right there. Right? You're ignoring or disliking <laughs> most of the comics that get made every month. Right? So I'm not worried about that. Like, I think it's going to be a fun story. It's quite different. Um, in some way, very much more violent. Um, what I've been saying is these are not superheroes. Wait, did you say it's more violent? It's <laughs> not more violent than it was. It's more violent oh, okay. than the Yeah, it's not I more violent like, well, than it used to be. No, no, it's it's about as violent as it was in the 90s. But um, it's different because of what you're allowed to draw, I suppose. So it may look more violent in some ways. Right. Um, but look, uh, these are not superheroes. If you're expecting someone to put on a big you know, capital S and fly up and save the day, probably should look elsewhere because you're going to be disappointed. These are not those folks. But nor are they, I've seen a lot of commentary about, um, oh, it's going to be these gangs going at each other, you know, viciously killing each other over turf wars. And, and I'm like, did you read the original? Because that was nothing to do with what the original was. Like, right. Yeah, right. So it's not that either. It's basically people trying to be good in a harsh world. And I can write that story because that's most people are trying to be good in a harsh world most of us are trying their best to be good. And the world doesn't always let you do that. So that plus superpowers is the blood syndicate. Um, I love it. Yeah. Uh, do so you have to package. change your origin? Uh, be, I know there was like a slight change with the bang. Yeah, slightly, slightly. Uh, the Big Bang happened differently, but the effect of the Big Bang, um, Paris Island is not Dakota City. Paris Island is the roughest neighborhood you don't want to walk through at night. So. Um, some of the people got their powers by the Big Bang, some of them getting their powers elsewhere, and that's a mystery. Um, our, our two main characters were not present for the Big Bang. Two of our three main characters were not present for the Big Bang, but they both have superpowers. Where did that come from? Like, So that's all part of the mix. Um, some of the things I pitched to Reggie and, and Dennis were about that because of that difference. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? Um, and if this is true, this is a lot of where my pitches go. If this thing that we all agree is true is so, then doesn't that mean that X, Y, and Z must also happen? And they'd be like, huh, you're not wrong. You know, and I'm like, cool. So these six issues won't get us all the way to that, this big thing. But right. it sets the groundwork for a mystery that we all know is there. And there is connective tissue between the events that gave Y, Sun, and Tech 9 their powers and why the others have their powers. It's just not all we were at the Big Bang. So um, it's going to be interesting, but it, it is its own animal, too. It is not, it's hard. Tonally, it's different, <laughs> tonally it's different than the other three books. It's just different. Uh, how are you? So one thing looking back, like, because when Milestone started to come back, they did that compendium. I went through some mm -hmm. of my old stuff. Mm -hmm. The only the one thing that some you know twenty years makes a lot of difference, right? But yeah, yeah. the one thing I noticed, um, I guess that stuck out like a sore thumb to me was when it came to masquerade, kind of that self hate. That's Is out. That, That's done. Not doing. I that. love it. Absolutely not doing that. Absolutely not. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. Uh, the other thing is that with Fade, one of the things was Fade was constantly pining away for unrequited love for possibly straight, possibly bi boy who was not right. giving anything back to him. That's out. Fade is an out gay man who is I love it. hovering around having a relationship like the way people do. 
Like maybe it'll be a relationship, maybe it won't, but all that self-hate crap, gone, gone. Ah, uh, perfect. Gone. Okay, that was the one thing that didn't hold up to me. And it was like, you know, like, yeah, our, our, you know, political um, times atmosphere sucks, but it has changed. Yeah. yeah, things have changed. A lot has changed for the better. And I think people forget that sometimes. But yeah. on the other side of that, Wise Son is a homophobe. And he's oh, one yeah? of the main characters in the book. So, so that's going to be yeah. interesting. So that's going to be an interesting nexus of relationships. Wise Son is a, this is what I'm saying. These are not superheroes. Everybody keeps describing right. them. Everyone who wants to describe them as superheroes is already getting off on the wrong foot. These are not superheroes. People are going to get murdered in this book by people who should be the good guys, right? I'm uh, guessing Holocaust, Holocaust is the villain. Holocaust is the villain. Definitely okay. the villain. I was going to oh, say. I'm just, is the yes. I'm just throwing out questions here while I yes. while I still yes. have you talking on the subject without getting you, you know, to put too so, much out so there. Far, so far, we're fine. So far, we're fine. Holocaust is absolutely the villain, but he's a villain with some, how do I say this right? I don't like sympathy for the devil in comic books, so mm -hmm. he definitely has a point of view, and it's a serious one that you can understand. I don't personally agree with it, and he's a monster. So how he goes about fulfilling his goals, he is the most ruthless human being on Paris Island. He does not care. He's like, I'm going to get this thing. And if my mom and my own child are in between me and the thing, mom and my kid got to go. So wow. that's how I am. You know, I love that. It wasn't that long ago, maybe two or three months ago, I did a, a video on how villains, the shifting we've had to, you know, we always had our sympathetic villains, whether it was Mr. Freeze yeah. or something like that. But yeah. it just, the lines have blurred into that anti-hero range yeah. so much. So to see an actual true evil, you know, uh, oh, for all the of the word. Let me put it to you like this. By the middle of issue two, you'll know where you're living with Holocaust. Okay? Holocaust is not here to play. He is here for real. Okay? I Holocaust does it. not play. The body count in this run of this book is not going to be low. Okay? I love it. Uh, nobody, I love it. Nobody's, nobody's trying to take folks to jail. Nobody's trying to talk you down out of your little rage moment. We solve problems permanently on Paris Island. Uh, uh, and good you have or bad. Cross. <laughs> What's that? And you have Crisscross as your artist. Crisscross is my man. How's that? <laughs> oh, so good. Well, okay. Interestingly, nothing against any other writer. And Chris did a couple of issues up on. Um, Green Lantern as well. Mm -hmm. uh, my scripts when I was writing Green Lantern were much, much tighter in some ways, much more specific. Um, nothing nothing against Tom and, and, and uh, Marco because they're fantastic and they certainly would be like, wouldn't it be better if you did it like this? And be like, oh yeah, that is much better. Do it like that. You know, whatever. <laughs> but, you know, because they're the visualists. Of course you're going right. to write. Right. But my scripts are always very, very, very detailed. The less I know that the smaller my knowledge of working with the person is, the more detailed my scripts are. Chris and I have now done, we did the Vixen thing, Truth and Justice. Oh, yeah, did you couple, did do that. Did a, yeah, and we did a couple of issues of Green Lantern. So, plus I know his artwork intrinsically um, because of me following his career all this time. So I can get a sense of what he's going to do. So there are spaces in these scripts where I'm just be like, okay, this happens on this page. By the end of the next page, this needs to happen. This is the argument that's going on. Here's the dialogue. Go. <laughs> that's right. amazing. That's trust. Yeah. And with the di with the designs of some characters, rephrase that, with the designs of the characters, especially the redesigns and updates of existing milestone characters, what am I going to say? Dude, you created half these people. Mm -hmm. Just update them how you want. Like, <laughs> I'm not yeah. influencing you. Like, do your thing. Right? And he has been. He and Juan Castro are a great unit. Uh, it is it is a thing, and uh, was Will, uh, who's doing the colors, mm -hmm. um, he is. It is it is it's I'm kind of cool. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm kind of weirdly bizarrely writing this book because of all the books I never thought I'd ever get to write because I never thought there'd ever be a chance. Blood Syndicate. I didn't think Milestone was coming back, much less Blood Syndicate. Right. So. You know, the fact that it's me writing this book, it's kind of trippy. Um, so, the, so yeah, so Chris is, Chris is a beast. Um, he's definitely bringing, bringing, bringing it with these new designs. We're trying very hard to make 
Paris Island a character in and of itself, right? So you Ooh. can hopefully look around and feel the neighborhoods you're in. I'm hoping for that. Um, whether that actually happens is up to the audience, but I'm hoping for that. Um, the artwork is just gorgeous. Um, the colors bring it out. It is it is a lovely thing to behold. Um, yeah, I, I'm honored to work with Chris on this. I, I can't I cannot stand how great it is. I love how you say you're having them having a it be a, a character of its own. That's one of the things that sometimes when writers write Batman, like Gotham mm -hmm. is a character, yeah. and you have to write it in that mannerism. I I'm not a writer. I yeah. I just ah! and, I just criticize and yell at a screen. Come on now, That's but so funny. <laughs> <laughs> like I wouldn't know how to do it. But I love. I don't know if it's how we as consumers read the stories, how we enjoy them. But sometimes there is an ability to make it actually come to life. And I'm so yeah, excited. I, I, I can't wait to read it. I, I definitely think um, I, it was probably it, it was announced at Fandom, right? Yeah, they did a they did a thing um, that the Blood Syndicate was coming back. I'm not certain because I didn't watch Fandom this year. I'm not certain that they said anything Blacker. about me because I'm not. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, the uh, I'm not certain that my deal had closed at that time, so it's possible that they didn't mention me for that reason. But yeah, I mean, they had always planned for somebody to do Blood Syndicate. I'm just kind of amazed it's me. Like, wow! So that's amazing. Yeah, um, the Blood Syndicate was always going to be number four. Um, it was always going to be the number four four book. And my plan was, okay, I'll do these first six, and then I'll go back to my 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 real career, TV, whatever. And mm -hmm. I'll be happy. My little twelve-year-old, or I guess nineteen-year-old self, will be happy, you know? <laughs> and um, you know, and all of that. But uh, I, and now that I'm in it, I'm like, hey, if this does well, I will stay till you pry it out of my cold, dead fingers. <laughs> like that's I, amazing. Like as, and I'm hoping Chris feels the same because it's just Chris and Chris, Will, and Juan as a unit are just like, oh, so gorgeous, gorgeous, darling. So. Um, yeah, I'm having a ball with it, and it's quite different from Green Lantern. Like, oh yeah, like completely like, different. Like n different everything. Like 100 completely different tone, approach, just uh, absolutely different thing. So um, that's fun for me too. Out of like, curiosity, just, I gotta ask about two characters, and then I promise okay. that I won't pry anymore. Anything you want. Anything you want. <laughs> um, will we see Oro? Oh. Uh... Well, here's the thing. I just gave an interview where I said Kwai would for sure not show up. She's my favorite, by the way. That's oh, is she really? Oh, I loved God, her I love design. Her. Oh, my God. I love Kwai so much. But I was mad at myself because I came up with a story where she could not appear. So uh -huh. the interviews that I've done so far, I've been saying Kwai will definitely not appear. But literally this morning, I was like, but could she, though? You know, like, <laughs> what, 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 if, what if we did it like this, right? And... So I'm not going to say she won't anymore because I have to let editorialists see if what my crazy ideas will work. But I love now, it. It's now more possible. Oro and all of that crowd, the Shadow Cabinet and the uh, Star Chamber, um, will. what happens in this arc kind of doesn't require them to show up. Okay. But um, it's not impossible. If I get there, Oro would be the one you would most likely see because mm -hmm. he's, his day job is beat cop, theoretically. But right. um, um, I don't know if I want to get there right away. I want to leave myself some running room for if we get a season two. Basically, every season is going to be bigger than the previous season. So I need to save some of the bigger guns gotcha. you know, for what's coming next. Although it's sort of loosely mapped out. And remember, there's three other books, and they're trying to keep them somewhat not exactly synced up in the sense of, like, we're not going to be exchanging villains and stuff like that. Right. But you know, if I exploded a nuclear bomb on Paris Island, I think people would notice it's a tiny <laughs> city. So, you know, so we can't do anything too big without making sure it all kind of coordinates. Is it, because I hate when they call them, mini, I like seasons. I'm still not used to that yet. Is it yeah, six or is it 12? Too. It's six. It's an arc. Okay. I, I, I don't like seasons either. I, I don't know who decided to start doing that. It irks me. But um, it is what it is. That we're calling them seasons. They're seasons. But it's an arc. Okay. It's just an arc. All right. Um, six <laughs> issue arc. Six okay. issue arc. And then if people dig it, I guess another six issue arc. 
and, and so on. Awesome. And by the way, it's, I've mapped it out pretty far. So it's really, if they like my direction, they know that I will keep writing it. So it's, it's kind of, it's all Perfect. on them. The, the, as usual, we serve at the pleasure of the president. Like Perfect. Yeah, I love it. So. Um, yeah, that season thing I started noticing when they introduced I'm, around the time they brought in Naomi, and I'm like, what? I'm not watching. What is this? this? Like, this is, this is not a show. This is yeah, not a show. like call it a mini or a maxi. Come on now, guys. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know who decided that. God bless them. Everybody's trying to do their best. But <laughs> for me, I was just like, this is no. I'm not. I'm not saying that. I'm not calling it that. It's, it's an so art. Weird. So, so one thing I wanted to ask because you you mentioned it here. Um, um that you you know you'd stay in comics but you used to do um mm -hmm. well acting and yeah. uh writing um yeah i yeah. <laughs> i what? i can't believe you were in the heat of the night that's so crazy oh dear god no i can't <laughs> believe it either I, I cannot believe it either that's like a completely other person i watch that when it comes on i'll see it and i'll be like yeah, that's weird. I have no memory of any of these events. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> so sad. No, it's just um well, I did a clean break with that career. Um I hit a sort of a wall with acting in those years. Like now mm -hmm. it's it's weird. We're talking about the blood syndicate and how it's changed, how the world has changed around telling a story like that. Um my acting career, I was looking at a life of sort of playing a cop, a good natured cop. Uh somebody's dad right. uh, like uncle phil on the fresh prince or uh what did i used to say i'm not as funny or i'm not as pretty as denzel i'm not as tough as uh as wood as uh was um not Woody, uh, uh wesley right and i'm not as funny as any so oh what does God. that lead right that leaves me a path that i just was like that seems like the most boring life to always be playing the lecturing dad for, like right. you can put your kids through college on that. There are plenty of actors who play that guy and have a ball and nothing against them. But I was like, yeah, that looks like that's going to be really dull. So, and I prefer writing anyway. So why don't I try that? And that was met with a lot of, are you high? You're on a network TV <laughs> show. What are you doing? Right. And people were like yelling at me. I was getting yelled at at parties by random people like, like you're quitting your show, you know, and I was like, I don't know you, ma'am. You should take about four steps back now. Why are you yelling <laughs> at me? You know, like, I can't believe it. You know, all this kind of crap. And at the end of the day, I feel like what's a, it's a line from um, when Harry met Sally, when you realize you want to spend the rest of your life with somebody, you want the rest of your life to start right now. Like it was kind of like that, like this is not for me anymore. I need to go do what is for me right now. So, and it was stupid. I had no fallback. I spent three, three years. Oh, on no. my, I spent three years on my ass scrambling for jobs. Oh, I was no. doing anything. It was a whole tragic operatic story for a few years. And then my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time was like, you're not doing well screenwriting. You're not, you can't get arrested, as we used to say, uh, as a screenwriter. Why don't you try writing some short stories or something like that? You're, you're not bad at that. Why don't you try it? I was like, who are you? Get out of my office. <laughs> uh, and um, I did. And I won or I placed. They didn't say I won. I got silver medals in a couple of contests, which led to being published. Uh, and then because I got published, people who were not taking me seriously in L.A., were suddenly taking me seriously. And I was like, I published three short stories and now I'm a real writer. But two weeks ago, the same script, you didn't even <laughs> want to read it. What the hell? You know, and so there's a much longer version of this. But basically, that sort of kickstarted me back into writing. Uh, I wanted to do films, but that didn't work out. So I ended up, I shouldn't say ended up, I, I pointed myself at TV and that was a better fit. And um, it's been, I don't know, was it 2022? 11 years, 15 years, depending on when you start counting. Um, and sort of looped back around to comics in a weird, crazy way. Um, always wanted to do comics. I did a lot of indie comics. Um, ironically, the job I got on, the first animation writing I ever did was because Dwayne McDuffie read uh, a comic my best friend and I made. Oh, wow. And, yeah, and he called me out at one of the conventions at the San Diego Con, like on the floor, Jeff Thorne. And I told <laughs> crap. Holy crap, you know, and Dwayne is, Dwayne is a guy, he's a mountain of a person. So you, once you know what he looks like, you can never not see him in a crowd because he towers over everyone. 
So if someone if he calls you out, you're like, oh shit, he sees me. He can definitely see me. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I'm like, what, what, what do you want? He's like, I read your comic, it's great. Um, and he gave me a blurb for it and everything, right? He get it and he's like, okay, cool. Uh, have you ever thought about pitching Ben 10? And I was like, no, I used to try to pitch you on Justice League and you guys shot me down. I figured I didn't have a career in writing animation. He's like, you're an idiot. I went um, <laughs> ten, 10 pitches from you in a couple of weeks, you know? And I was like, okay, sir, you know? And, um, and so I pitched him a bunch of stuff and they bought one and the network liked it, he liked it. Um, and I sort of had that as a secondary writing career going alongside my live action writing. Uh, and so 10 years later, I got to write, I got to be the head writer, showrunner on um, Black Panther's Quest. And uh, that was kind of like, I don't know where you can go after that. Like, right. what else can I do? So, I mean, I might do some more animation. It depends on, it's very project dependent, you know, like, I just don't know what it would what it would take for me to come back. It would have to be like a really good friend or such. Like if someone had said, "Come write Arcane," oh, I would God. have jumped on that. Like, yeah. yes, yes. You oh know? my gosh, that was so good. It was a sleeper hit for me. But Dear I'm like, what? This, this. I know. I need. I didn't know I needed this in my life, but apparently I did. Well, let me ask you this, Miss Tristan: um, Is it woke? Oh, it's woke as fuck. Is it? It's woke as fuck. <laughs> But why is it woke as fuck? Isn't it I don't know woke? because it's I'm got saying, women in it. I don't know anymore. It, I don't know the rules. It's got, like that's what I'm saying. I don't think there are any. I think that that word is just used as like to say I don't like that for social reasons that I don't quite understand. But this word seems to cover it. You exactly. Because like that's pretty much. I, I'm looking at that thing and I'm like, people are going to call this woke, and I'm trying to figure out where is the politics in this amazing fantasy thing that I'm watching, and the politics has to be. Women in prominent Women. roles, uh, people who are not straight in prominent roles, brown, brown, and I say golden, not yellow, people in prominent roles, and uh, if you're going to find a way to dislike it, I guess you're going to fight hard to do that because it is gorgeous. It oh is my beautiful. It's as good as Into the Spider Verse. That's yeah, like, yeah. Like I was, I was. Um, it never heard of League of Legends. I mean, I had heard of it. Me either. Right, I never played that game. Yeah, I'm like, why? Why do people keep telling me to review this? What is so good about it? And after completing it, I'm like, oh my <laughs> god, why did I not have this in my life before? It was, yep, yep beautiful, yep, yep, yep. beautiful yep. animation. They went crazy. Of course, they dumped a ridiculous amount of money into that show, but every penny was well was spent well from my point of view. But yeah, so yeah, you bring me a show like that. Hell yeah, I'll come write that show. Yes, ma'am. But um, for the most part, I don't know what more I can do in animation than what I've already done. So I'm basically writing live action stuff and comics and occasionally a short story or maybe a novel if I can scrape up enough free time to do either one of those things. Uh, I like writing. I just like writing. And I like writing the kind of stuff we all like. I like elves and cyborgs and aliens and demons and that kind of crap. That's the kind of stuff I write. So, you know. Is the um, Black Panther, um, was that what it got you into the big two? Um, that's weird. Here's what happened with that. You mean as a comic book reader or as a writer? Writer, sorry, writer. Okay. Um, okay, For it's two different things. Um, one, I as, as much as people think of me as a newcomer, I've actually been doing indie comics since 2009, off and on. Um, and stuff that a lot of people may not have heard of I've scripted, sometimes uncredited. Um, and I put out a couple of my own things with my mm -hmm. partner, Todd. Uh, we did a Dark Horse thing called Journeyman in Dark Horse Presents. So there, when people would mention my name to someone, I wasn't someone that they could go, I may not have heard of him, but I had work to show. I'd be like, right. oh, he did the Dark Horse thing or whatever, right? Um, so that was one thing. I believe during Marvel Now, Marvel now, right? When they did the deck shuffle, that's when Miss Marvel was. Yeah, with the all new, all different. Yeah. yeah, it was either all new, all different or Marvel now, either one of the two things, right? Um, they were like, we need to bring in some new blood. And so they asked all their existing people, who do you know that we don't know? And my name, I guess, came up. So they called me. They said, would you like to take a meeting? And I was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> um, Marvel Comics, Axel Alonso, yes, okay, you know, um, and 
I didn't have a pitch for them exactly. Like I was, it kind of came out of left field. I was approached because Jerry Duggan was not in the actual meeting that where my name had come up, but when it got expanded out to include him, he actually knows me. So he was like, Oh, I know Jeff. He'll probably say yes. And they're like, you know him? Tell him we want to get a hold of him. <laughs> so and I was like, so I get this call. He, like he, he has all of my digits and everything. They just got a hold of me. And we talked, Axel and I talked. Um, and the first the first thing we talked about was what do you want to do? Like, what would you like to do? And I was like, that's such a broad question, like Mr. Axel Alonso. Um and he's like, Well, before you start, can't do anything with the X-Men. And I was like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, like, I guess. Like that's, he's like, that's soda, right? Well, for a billion reasons at the time, it was prior to um, it was prior to Disney eating Fox. So oh, they yeah. owned the X-Men movies, so they weren't trying to do anything spectacular with that. Um, and I was like, okay, well, what about it? He's like, can't do anything with the Fantastic Four, same reason, sorry. <laughs> and I was like, okay, okay, this is getting irritating. And then he's like, and before you even go down that road, the Avengers are already sewed up. <laughs> and I was like, well, wait. At this point, almost every character in Marvel Comics has at some point been an event. <laughs> so what does that leave me? He's like, well, pitch me something new. And I was like, what? <laughs> Brand what? new? You really? Like, he's like, yeah, what you got? So I pitched him this thing, which is going to be kind of like a body horror uh, sci-fi thing about a guy who gets kicked out of his body and can only jump into other people's bodies to sort of live. Um, it's not quite parasitical, but sort of parasitical. And his whole thing is, I want my freaking original body back. Um, he's like, oh, that's dope. That sounds like a Vertigo book. And I was like, yeah, it is kind of. He's like, oh, we haven't done anything like that in a while. Or ever, maybe, at Marvel. Cool, let's do that. And I was like, all right. So I wrote up a treatment for it, a little quick pitch for it, sent it to him. And he's like, OK, this is great. Um, what are you going to call it? And I was like, how about Mosaic? Right, because of the way the powers were going to work. Right, and he's like, "Yeah, that's great." Except, didn't DC have a character? I think called Green Lantern Mosaic. Yeah, and I, was like, <laughs> I was like, "Yeah," and no one remembers it but you and me. Don't worry <laughs> about it. <laughs> okay, it's got nothing to do with that. Don't worry about it. Right? He's like, "Cool, bet." Here's a contract. Get to writing. And then, either he or the next editor, either it was him or Nick Lowe, I can't remember which one. He got fired. Axel got fired. Uh huh. Um, I know and what time so, period now. <laughs> there you go, right? But I'm in the middle of writing my outlines and stuff, and then Nick comes in, and he's like, so it's either Axel or Nick. I can't really remember. But they were like, so about this character, can he be an Inhuman? And I was like, sure, I like the Inhumans. Why not? You know, not realizing the shit storm that I was about to walk into. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> because everyone was so mad that the X-Men were being pounded in favor of the Inhumans. And I was like, well, it doesn't really matter because this character is such a dick that it doesn't really matter what group you want to affiliate him with. No one's going to want to hang around him. He's an asshole. <laughs> so, so I thought I was covered. And then the whole X versus Inhumans thing happened and Civil War, I guess, two happened. And he got pulled into that. And it was a whole weird thing. And they tried to market it as... Pardon me, he's a basketball player by day and a superhero by night. And I was like, no, he's a basketball player on four pages. <laughs> and then the whole rest <laughs> of the time, he's a monster, you know. And so, and there were and there were like weird little things about that where they were like, they would make change. Anyway, so blah, 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 blah. So while that's going on, Jerry comes to me and says, Look, we're going to be spinning off um the characters from Deadpool and the Mercs for money. And I was like, okay. And he's like, well. I can't write them all. I can, I'm already doing a bunch of stuff. How you want to go halves on the solo book? And I was like, you mean, you don't mean hand solo? And he's like, no, no, solo, solo, one man, you know, terrorist killer or whatever. And I was like, you guys are doing a book about solo? <laughs> he's like, no, we are, you and I are going to do a book about solo. And I was like, why? Oh my <laughs> and he, gosh. And he was like, are you saying no? Because just say no. You don't need to clap. <laughs> Right, right, and I'm like, I'm not saying no. I'm just saying, it's solo. He's a pun. He's the Punisher with a teleporter. Like he kills terrorists. That's like three pages of a book. <laughs> like what's what's the book going to be about? <laughs> and he's like, forget all that. We can do what we want. Right, and I was like, oh, I love that. I love him. Yeah. What? Right. So we put our little heads together over about two days and came up with this book, which both of us knew as soon as it hit the stands was going to be dead on arrival. But what the hell? 
let's have a ball and see what happens. What's the worst that can happen? Zero, right. which is what we knew was probably going to happen. <laughs> but we had a good time with it. Um, and so all of a sudden, I got these two books coming out from Marvel. And because of the way that I was working in Mosaic, I was part of the Spider-Man office. So, Ooh. oh, okay. So at one point in the Mosaic story, Mosaic jumps into the body of an established Marvel superhero. What I wanted to do, and you'll think this is hysterical, he wanted to figure out how his powers work because he doesn't know anything. He's just, just suddenly has these powers and it's weird and they sort of act automatically and he's freaking out like anyone would. But then he's like, well, wait a minute. Tony Stark, I met him at one of these big celebrity parties. He was trying to get me to endorse something because I was a big basketball player and, you know, whatever. But I know where he is at Stark Tower or whatever the hell they were calling it at the time. So if I could jump into his body while I'm in it, I'm as smart as he is and I can figure all this shit out, right? So he was going to go to Stark International <laughs> and then start jumping into random bodies as he rose up to the penthouse where Tony Stark was. Oh, my gosh. But it was Stark International, right? So it's not like any random person can break in there. This guy goes to other planets and beats people up. Like, whatever you think you've got, <laughs> he's probably got a defense against it. Oh, so my at gosh. Some point, right. So at some point, his security staff's like, we don't know what's going on, but something's going on in the building. Lock the building down. So now he's trapped in someone's body and all he can do is jump between bodies to get to Tony Stark. Maybe he finally, finally gets to Tony and he jumps into Tony's head. And instead of being like the goofball playboy, drinks a lot, womanizer guy, he finds an incredibly regimented mind that is basically a series of blocks and he can't get into any of the blocks. That's how oh disciplined Tony Stark's mind was, right? And that was that whole issue. And I presented that and they're like, yeah, you can't do that with Tony's dead. <laughs> And I was no. like, wait, what? When did you? It's like, well, it hasn't happened yet, but by the time this happens, he will be dead. So you can't. You have to use Spider-Man or somebody else. And they said, what about Spider-Man? So I was like, sure, Peter's a genius. People always forget Peter Parker's a freaking genius. Right. So um, fine. So we did something. This is what I'm saying. Like, the public gets a story, but they don't ever take into account the pitch versus what you see is often quite different from book to book, right? Like from issue to issue. It, it's all oh, yeah. depends on what's what's happening in the universe at large and what the company needs for a given character. So whatever. So he jumped into Spider-Man. So years later, I'm part of the Spider-Man office. So like if I want to pitch something, I pitch to Nick Lowe first, right? I don't, mm -hmm. or, or one of his assistants. Right. So that's what got me in at Marvel and being in at Marvel is an interest or either of these companies, although DC is still sort of ongoing. Um, they know you when they know you and they don't know you when they don't know you. So you can pitch stuff, but you might not hear anything back for a million years. And then instead right. of hearing back on the thing you pitched, they will call you up and say, hey, would you like to do this thing? I'm like, but didn't <laughs> I just pitch you guys like a year ago? I thought you guys weren't talking to me anymore. No, no, we got that pitch. I'm like, do you want to talk about it? Well, we got that pitch. <laughs> so anyway, we would like to talk to you about this thing. And oh, like, my oh. gosh. Like, it's just like whatever with that. But <laughs> but um, but it's, it's not anything like... Again, if you read this, people, if someone were to read what I just said, you'd think I'm complaining. I'm not. It's just the way it is. Like, right. It's the nature of this particular beast. That's just how it works. So point being, so I got to do something in the Spider-Verse thing. Um, it's weird how it ping pongs around. Also, obviously, I like writing marginalized characters. They don't all have to be black. But a lot of those characters don't get the attention over the years right. that the other characters do. So when I come up with stories, it's like, well, I'd like to flesh out Vixen or I'd like to do something with Misty Knight or something like that. It has almost nothing to do with their skin color. It's just the coincidence of people haven't done much with them. So right. that gives me more freedom to play. So did a whole bunch of stuff for Nick, had a really good time. And then somebody over in the Black Panther office looked up and went, well, wait a minute, this guy ran the Black Panther cartoon. Let's see if he wants to do something in King and Black. And then they tap you. You don't tap them. I did not approach them. Right. You know, uh, and oh my God, I completely forgot. That's why they brought me into Marvel in the first place to pitch Black Panther. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> That's what fucking happened. So, right. So they're like, you know, they were like, call this guy up to pitch Black Panther. And then they didn't take my pitch. They took Tana Hesse Coates' pitch. Right. So I was like, well, I guess that's my time at Marvel. Oh, that's their so, I'm just saying, then, I wasn't. Yeah. Oh. One day we'll be off the mic. I'll tell you my pitch. Uh, <laughs> you'll be like, damn it. But um, no, so that didn't happen. And then Axel was like, look, you didn't get that pitch, but I liked everything you had to say. And that's where Mosaic came from. Uh -huh. right? so, 
right? So you obviously have other ideas and you know Marvel very well. I'm like, yes, I've been collecting comics since I was five years old. I think I know Marvel fairly well, right? Um, and that's where Mosaic came from. And a similar situation happened in DC where I was working on a show and I had done all this stuff for Warner Animation. So a guy at Warner Animation said, hey, Jeff, I was just in a high level meeting where I guess all of their department heads, so like the animation, comics, film, all of these guys get together from time to time. I say guys in the non-gender sense. People right. get together and they um, discuss stuff, right? And one of the things they wanted to do was sort of knock open the doors. This is when AT&T had taken over and they were like, you know, this kind of lily white and kind of male over here. You guys need to bring in some people. <laughs> um, and who would want to do it? So this guy I'd worked with said, is this something you'd even be interested in? And I'm like, are you stupid? Just say <laughs> yeah. You know, like, I don't know why people think I wouldn't be interested. If anyone who's met me knows I love this crap. So like the idea that you have to ask me, you should have volunteered me. Like, what are you doing? So I said, cool, cool, cool. Um, I met Dan DiDio. And this was, I guess, what I don't pay attention to is shit like 5G or oh, yeah. Into the Frontier or um, Death Metal. I don't care about all of that crap. I just read the books I like. And if there's a giant event going on, yeah, maybe, but it doesn't hook me. It doesn't put me off. I don't care about that. So I did not know all the controversy or whatever about whatever this 5G thing was. Uh, so I go in and I meet Dan. Um, we talk for a bit. He shows me the wall of amazingness that I think would have been 5G. And I was like, wow, that's a... Uh... Oh, you got to see it. Oh, baby. Uh, I was like, that is a lot, sir. That is a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he's like, is that a good thing? I'm like, it's it's a lot. Um, <laughs> and, and there were a lot of good things. There were, I would say, of the things that were on that wall, and there was, you can't imagine how comprehensive this was. Like, it was ridiculous. It was like going into the Manhattan Project before they built the first atomic bomb and saying, oh, hey, here's our God. blackboard with all our formula on it, right? Oh. <laughs> Holy shit, guys. It took up a wall, not a oh, little wall, God. a wall, right? Okay. So I'm looking at it and I'm trying to pick out points that I can understand what they're doing. And I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, so when, how long is it going to take to roll all this out? And he's like, oh, we're doing it in January. And I'm like, excuse me, what? <laughs> <laughs> right? And I was like, you're not doing all this in January. This is years worth of rollout here, right? And he's like, no, no, we're doing it all in January. There's going to be a sl slight break <laughs> and then this. And I'm like, have you made travel plans to live in another <laughs> country? Because people will kill you when you do this. <laughs> right? Because there wasn't anything wrong with it to me, for the most part, except the speed at which they were going to do the rollout. I was like, there's no, there was no buildup. There was no setup. It was just going right. to be, you went to bed one morning, DC was this way. You got up the next morning and DC was this new way. Now, some people would have liked that new way, guaranteed, because I like a whole bunch of that stuff. But that fast? Nope. Death. Instant death. Oh my there's gosh. There's no way. There's no way. Right? He's like, we're doing it. Shut up. Got any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, not for this exactly, because this seems already done. <laughs> but I have some I have some stuff, sure. And I pitched a, a many ideas. Um, and he liked, I think, three of the 10 plus ideas I pitched. I had a weird Blackhawk story, um, which only used the title Blackhawk. It didn't have anything to do with the original Blackhawks, except they used, pardon me, Blackhawk Island. Um, other than that, nothing. I pitched the jo a version of the John Stewart story, and I pitched... Lois Lane and the Global Guardians, which would have been the hardest motherfucking book on the market oh, no. if they had gone for it. But they had plans for Lois. So, like, they knew the Lois and Clark show was coming. They knew right. like, things, things they didn't tell me, but they knew these things were coming. So it couldn't do that. So it all boiled down to John. And um, so that was going on. And I haven't, I actually literally just today put up a uh, annotation on my Patreon telling about the details of how that all worked out. But while that's going on, if you ever, you're not on Twitter, but if you ever look at my Twitter, amongst all me, all the hyper political crap that I say, uh, I mostly talk about geek stuff. And one of the things I do from time to time is I'll just be like, oh my God, I just, like the other day, I just figured out how to solve the problem of Wanda Maximoff. <laughs> been, right. I'm not sitting there thinking about, oh, today we have to take an hour and really figure out Wanda. It's not like that. It's like you're watching TV and you're like, oh, wait a minute. If we just did this and this and this, Wanda would work perfectly and nobody'd be mad at her anymore. Huh. Right? And then you go on Twitter and you go, I just solved X. So I went on Twitter and I said, hey, I got this idea for Vixen that would be really cool. I didn't say what the Vixen idea was, 
I just said I had one. Chris Cross, who apparently followed me on Twitter, I did not know that until this moment, um, was like, really? Capitals, capital letters, all, right? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, yes, Mr. Chris Cross, <laughs> right? Uh, but you don't know, he's like, um, all right, I'm gonna call my editor. And I was like, why? You don't know what the idea is? It's too late, I already called it. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and I was like, this is crazy. He's punking me. This is nonsense. I sure as shit got an email the next day from the editor that said, hey, Chris Cross says you had a Vixen idea. We'd like to do some stuff with Vixen if you got something. And I was like, Chris does not know what the idea is. Why are you like, <laughs> you know, it could be terrible, right? And he's like, well, lay it on me, brother. And I said, well, I think Vixen's a tank. I think you guys have been playing her wrong. You, you've given her this set of abilities, but no one has ever really cracked what that actually means. She's not like Animal Man who can really just take on a power at a time. She can stack up not only every animal that's on Earth right now, that exists right now, but every animal that's ever existed on Earth. And she's not limited by how many she can do at one time. Think about it. Think about it. How big is a whale? How strong oh, yeah. is a whale? What if I'd stacked up all of the whales into one person that are on Earth right now? You don't think she could put Superman on the deck if she wanted to? Right? How fast is fast for her? Now, there'll be other issues, like she doesn't have speed force. Right. So that cuts friction. People always forget the biggest thing the speed force is explains why the flashes don't burn up when they run yeah. that fast, because they're surrounded by this fucking speed force. She doesn't have that. So her max speed would be something like Mach 2, Mach 5, maybe, running or flying, because her body would take damage after a certain point. But Unless she was also invulnerable because she was a fire ant at the same time, right? Uh -huh. so I, was laying, I was laying out all this shit and why it was that way. And he's like, that's dope. Do you have a story? And I was like, no, I don't have a story. <laughs> I said, I just had a fix. That's why Chris is a maniac, right? <laughs> I, I, I told him not to do this. He's like, whatever. Next week, I want to hear a pitch on this. Right? <laughs> and I was like, all right, fine. So I pitched him something. And I was like, I like the Global Guardians, so could we do a Vixen in the Global Guardians book? And he's like, well, that's probably big for what we're trying to do. Let's just introduce some stuff. And you've got a little story arc that sort of opens that up. Can you compress that down to basically one book? We're going to do it um, digitally first, so it's got to be paced a different way than you might expect, but tell the same story. So it's basically a 30-page book, but spaced weirdly because it's going to be Digital. Yeah, that drove me crazy, by the way. Me too, me too, me too, me too. And you know what's really irritating about that? Nobody told me that was ultimately going to be a print book. Because if it had known that it was ultimately going to be in print at some point, I would have paced the damn thing completely differently. Right? So whatever. Who cares? That's life. Uh, <laughs> but so that happened because of that. And um, I got to reuse some of the concepts I wanted to do for Lois and the Global Guardians and put that in there and sort of set up Vixen and the Global Guardians. Yeah, it did what it did. I don't think it did well enough for them to want to go crazy with a Vixen book. But um, so that's how I got in with Chris in a certain way. And then Vic Green Lantern was sort of ongoing throughout this stuff. It was just still in the pre-planning stage, I guess. Like we were still right. plotting it and all this other crap was going on, whatever. So that was all happening simultaneously. Um, and so you look up after a couple of years and you've done all this stuff, like on paper, it looks like a lot of stuff for both companies. Um, but in reality, what is it, three jobs, four jobs? They just take a while to get through them all. Um, and I'm, I'm having a good time with it. If they ever say, okay, that's that's your time in the sun, then I'm good. Like, I'm, I'm fine if they never call me again. I'm fine if they let me keep running. Like, I'm amazed that I'm here. Like, I'm amazed my 12-year-old Jeff self is like, you're right, what now? <laughs> right? Know? Like, like truly though, like, and I'm lucky because it's not my source of income. Like they pay you, but because it's not where I make my actual money to live, I have way less stress on me than a normal comic book writer would have because this is their livelihood. Like they right. got to write more than one book if they want to make anything like a decent living. Um, it, it's, it's a brutal job if you do it right. It's brutal. And I feel like they don't get paid enough. Not me specifically. Absolutely I, not. I'm good. And I think that they should all have the profit share and the characters they're making up since in the old days, those contracts were, they're work for hire contracts and you can't get mad if you sign a work for hire contract and then somebody turns it into a Ferrari and you didn't get any Ferrari money. Right. Tough, but you, you signed a work for hire contract. But that was back when comic books were just comic books. That's all you were ever going to get out of them. Yep. Right. No one was going to turn it into a movie or a, 
you know, a clothing line or a video, <laughs> screen, right? No one was going to do any of that crap. But now we know for sure they probably will. So give these people a cut. 1% ain't breaking anybody's bank, but it will change the life of the person who came up with the Winter Soldier. And you'll have a lot better, you know, return. Right. And, and yeah. you'll keep people like it. Let's be real. When when it comes to not only writers and artists, but thinking about the colorists and the letterers, like exactly, they're, exactly. they're so underpaid and underappreciated in a lot. Like lettering for me sometimes can make a difference in a book just because I'm blind. <laughs> like uh, sure. and like, um, do you remember when they first introduced the Batman Who Laughs and it had that like <laughs> black and red writing and it always yeah, looked yeah, yeah. 3D but to me and I'm like. Oh, so bad. And I'm like, don't do this to me. Don't <laughs> do this. Me? You're hurting it, people. <laughs> well, I love the bad man who laughs, but that writing is so hard. But like yeah. those people are so underappreciated. And really, honestly, it takes a team for one yeah. book to come out. And people don't yeah. realize when they're yeah. so cruel that you're being. I agree with that. It, it just well, it, it blows my mind. That's about it is having worked on the on the Hollywood side what we're talking about is such a small percentage of total revenue right. that giving these people a cut of a couple of percent of the, uh, of the gross, not the net, um, right. that that costs you nothing. That's a bar bill for some of these people, right? Yeah. That's not even a bar bill. That's if you buy the whole bar over and over again. Right. But again, for a guy or a lady who's working at their small first apartment or, you know, they live in Idaho or someplace and that's where the work gets done. That money stream for work put in and which is generating revenue for you, that small percentage from, from your side is a giant percentage. Yeah. For them. So it could be the difference of, in a lot of yes, people's eyes. Between it the between living okay and scrambling. Yeah. And I'm like to me, of course, it seems like meanness and cruelty because what we're talking about is such a small amount from the point of view of the big guys right. that it's almost like, no. Yeah. <laughs> really? With a sneer? Come on. Yep. <laughs> Damn. Deal, you know. peasant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, you know, and I think there is a certain attitude, that, and it does come from the Hollywood side or the big, big business side, which is, look, it's your privilege to work for us. You know, and I'm like, no, it's not a fucking no. privilege. It's work. No. That's what we yeah. call it work. <laughs> you know? Oh, goodness. It's work. It's work. That... it's work. And it should be compensated. You know, you see big stars like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or somebody, they'll sue. They're like, you're, this movie that you were working on, working for me, made X amount of money and you didn't give me my cut. So the next time you hire me, you're going to give me that cut or you're going to pay me so much money. Yeah. Right. To do it. The problem is, is that comic book creatives don't have that kind of clout. They can't directly connect. I did X, therefore the revenue exists most of the time. Problem right. is when you read, I'm using a Winter Soldier. It's Ed Brubaker, I think. Oh God, a Winter poor Soldier man. Is an example. Well, whatever. It's a work. Like half of my head is, look, tough shit. It's a work for hire contract. Too bad, right? I get it. The other it. part of my head. Wait. The other part of my head is. Like I said, you knew something big was going to come out of this. The, the the company does. But he can draw a straight line. It's not random. Like back in 1938, I came up with, you know, Dogfight Man, you know. Right. And then 90 years later, someone makes a blockbuster out of Dogfight Man and I didn't get my cut. Sorry. So sorry. You don't deserve a fucking cut. But if Ed Brubaker pulls Bucky Barnes... <laughs> Yep. Out of mothball hell, turns him into the coolest thing ever. And then someone in Hollywood recognizes, wow, that's the coolest thing ever. Let's make some movies about him. He didn't come out of nowhere. It's a straight line. Pay the man. Yep. Right? So either the contracts need to be reworked or the salaries need to go up. But something needs to change because of the paradigm shift. And... I don't see it happening because there is a morality aspect to it that a lot of people don't figure in. And I don't I don't see what's going to make the people who make that decision figure that morality in. Like I said, it doesn't cost them much to do it. So since it costs them so little, it has to be kind of like a fuck you to me. Yeah. And, and I get it. And, and, and it's totally why I get like when it comes to, you know, Alan Moore being mm -hmm. the way he Salty. is. I get it. He, you you yeah. have a reason to be jaded. 
Yeah, he's salty as fuck. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. I, I mean, when I'm talking to creatives who are trying to get in, I'm like, look, this is a hardball game, okay? I know we all love it. I love this shit too. Deeply, deeply love it. And we can go off in the geek world and have a wonderful conversation. But please understand, don't put your heart in a lot of these things because it will get broken. If it's not written into the contract, it's not covered by the contract. Right. Right. And Alan Moore took a lot of handshakes from a lot of people who weren't working at the company when the decisions that he's mad about were made. Right. Those people were no longer there to make sure that they honored the deal. You shook hands with who? Well, they don't work here anymore. I, yeah. didn't shake your fucking, I didn't shake your fucking hand, Mr. Alan Moore. We got some money to make. Sorry. Tough. Shouldn't have signed that contract. You know, like, why would I? Everyone yeah. was telling me, you know, so, but that comes into morality and there really isn't any at that level unless someone can make a way to force that morality. And I don't know, I don't see a way to do that. Um, it, no. It's depressing. It is. And and it's, it's also understandable why people are writing their comics towards mm-hmm. us, you know, to be able to easily adaptable. I get it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I get it. I do a hundred percent. You deserve to get paid. Right. And then there's somebody like me who has another career that pays them well enough to live a decent life who just loves comics. So they could pay me what's top dollar for a comic book writer or slightly below because let's fit, let's be real. I'm not anybody's comic book writing star, right? But I'm making a pretty good good salary writing these books for what a comic book writer would make. But at this stage of my life and the way me and my wife live, which isn't so big high on the hog, we just live in an expensive city. I couldn't live. Right. I could not I could not do it. I would have to write I would have to write full time probably four ongoing comics to get near what and I don't live in some extravagant anything. Like I'm not an extravagant person. I don't do any of the things maybe people would think doing the job I do. But right. even so, you know, so I am unusual. Yeah, I'm unusual. I can take that gig and feel no pain, basically. Like it, it doesn't hurt me to take the small salary. And if they were to take the salary away, it doesn't hurt me. Right. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to go over here and do this other thing I do. That's most people aren't in that position. And it's it's not right. I just saw a thing about um, William Mercer Loeb's being um, rescued by the Hero Initiative because he's essentially homeless. Oh, my God. And I'm yeah. like, come on, man. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Come on. They posted a video and it was heartbreaking. Yeah, that's ridiculous. It's it's brutal. It's ugly, it, and there's no reason for it. In None. regular in regular publishing, I get residuals or royalties. I get royalties in regular publishing that are not amazing, but if you wrote enough, you you'd have a revenue stream. Right. Um, I get re- I get royalty checks from Marvel and DC as well. And actually, well, that's a whole long other story. But <laughs> the, that's just a whole TED talk by itself. But the amounts and the percentages are just not they don't relate to the amount of work put in and they don't relate to the amount of revenue people are getting out of these characters. Um, and sometimes, oh my God, we go off on this for hours. <laughs> I do. I know we've been talking for a while, so I got to ask you one more question before we wrap up. And there's got to be one character, right? One yeah. character you haven't written at. <laughs> I guess we can leave it limited to the big two that you okay. want to get on, that you would love oh, to write. Uh, I wanted to write forge in the worst way um marvel seems completely uninterested in that pitch um i wanted to write lois lane and the global guardians really bad but really wanted to write the global guardians really bad (laughs) Um, and like because i came up with a mission for them that means they're not the titans and they're not the um they're not justice league wannabes anymore right right their job is we find all the crap and we stamp it out before it gets big enough before it becomes big enough for the Justice League to worry about it. And I was like, that's Mission Impossible with superpowers. Let me write that book. Plus, plus <laughs> Lois Lane is kind of a badass by herself. Oh, my God. Well, that was the thing with Lois, why I wanted to write Lois, is that people always look at Superman, right? Because he's fucking Superman. Right. <laughs> but Lois is like an apex woman. Right? What was her life if he never shows up? She's that chick that's undercover in freaking Afghanistan or or joins the mafia for two years to get the goods of somebody. Like, <laughs> oh my Lois, gosh. Lois is hard as hell. Uh-huh. Right. Like I could write the Lois Lane reporter book just with in a world of superpowers, she's the most dangerous woman. Me and my camera, you don't you rather deal with Superman than me. Trust me. Right. 
And they were like, yeah, we got plans for Lois. Sorry. Oh, geez. So, you know, and I'm like, I mean, you don't own them. You can't take it personally. You right. I get it. But yeah. So I wouldn't mind doing the Global Guardians. I would love to do the Global Guardians. Um, plus, it's a way to get at some of the things that people get mad about. These characters already exist. So like in the low, in the Vixen story, Chris and I were having a ball making up new Global Guardians. Same names, similar power sets, but like there's a character called the Olympian. And he, he's a he, a Greek man who's wearing the golden fleece, right? He's mm -hmm. got a helmet, it's attached to the golden fleece like a cape. And what it is, is if you're wearing it, you have all the powers of Jason and the Argonauts while you're wearing it. But it also makes you a dick because the more <laughs> it you- It also makes you a dick. It does. <laughs> I love it, it. it. The more you wear it, the more you're like, well, I'm the best. I'm all the Argonauts, <laughs> right? It's part of the magic of the cape. So I was like, well, I don't want to write this guy like that all the time. How about he's married? Right. And he's married to a woman who totally gets him and she's, you know, cool, whatever. And when he's not wearing the freaking outfit, he's a wonderful guy. So wonderful that they have six kids together. So they got to split parenting duties. So now there's Olympian one, the dude, and there's Olympian two, the wife, except she knows what the cloak does to you. So she never wears it long enough to turn into an asshole. Oh, my right? gosh. That's so, so good. Right. And so Olympian two shows up and we even have commentary. Oh, we're going to call it Olympian because she's one of our, it's one, the Olympian's one of our big guns. And the Impala character is like, please let it be Olympian too, because I really can't see that other <laughs> right? And that's the kind of fun we could have with international characters from other countries. You know, um, a South Africa, well, this was a funny idea, I thought. The South African representative is white. The British representative is black. I right? love because it. Because shit like that you could do for days with global guardians and mm -hmm. the kind of stories they have would be very much mission impossible so they wouldn't always be in costumes and they wouldn't be doing things that you're like well this is a justice league story like it wouldn't be like that so anyway they're not doing it but that's what i want to do it should, um, really. yeah, but, so, and yeah it sounds amazing but like that would be i i would you know what that's sometimes what i feel like i as critical as I am at times of DC, that would be that would be something that break the mold, something different. And I don't and I don't feel like. Yeah, I, don't know. <sighs> I just want him to take a chance. <laughs> I know they do, but I'm just saying, like, give us those yeah. B characters. I agree with you. And I feel like hmm, I need to say this the proper way. I think that their idea of what taking the chances and what you and I might think of as taking the chance are different. Right. And now that like it's discovery now. But as soon as these big corporations bought them, the reasons for why they do stuff changed. So, like, I could sit down, and you know this has happened at conventions, a creative and a two creatives sit down at a bar, at the, at the bar part of the convention. And they're like, hey, I really love that Sandman, you know, that, that, that uh, death and the high cost of living thing you did, Pierce Dark, bro. What do you think about doing something with Doctor Strange? Really hadn't thought about doing anything doc with Doctor Strange. What are your thoughts? Well, I was going to do this, and he's going to fall into this pit, and there's going to be all these dragon wizard things. Man. He's like, so, so, who do we talk to about it? Uh, 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 oh, hey, isn't that Nick Lowe over there? Yeah. Hey, Nick, listen to this. Now, in the old days, that's enough to get you a miniseries, probably. Right. Right? But nowadays, well, let me think about it. They got that Doctor Strange movie coming out. Oh, shit. Okay, guys. Um, it's a good pitch. Let me get back to you. And when I get back to you, here are the 90 reasons why we can't do it. Yep. You know? They're trying so, to have synergy, but it, I don't see it. I don't... Okay. It's weird. It, it, it is weird because I also feel like a lot of the movie-going audience isn't necessarily reading the comics, so just let us have uh, our little niche. <laughs> that's what I see, too. I, I mean, I think it's proven that comic book readers will go see a movie. But people who only know these characters from the movies, why are they reading comics they were never going to buy anyway? Like, right. They would just wait for the next movie like everyone. Right. Like, you know, and the proof is they don't go and buy the comics. So, yeah. you know, I mean, it's nothing against the, the average movie. Ugh! Tristan, this is such a long conversation. Listen, um, <laughs> I mean, I don't mean that it's I don't mean it's too long now. I'm saying the thing. No, I get it. I totally yeah. get it. OK, so in a nutshell. The job of selling comics is different than the job of selling movies. Movies are for everybody. Comics are for a niche market. So while they have things in common, the things that appeal to people who like comics don't always appeal to people who like movies. But the things that appeal to people who like movies appeal to everybody. Right. So 
as a result, as soon as it was clear that there's not going to be any crossover between the two branches, let's say, of the company in that regard, you, what you said is right. That should have freed up the comic book people to go, well, cool. If they're not, if the movie people aren't coming over here, we should just go Buck Wild because Buck Wild is what created all the stuff that you're turning into movies now. Yep, exactly. Right? Like, ignore us and let us play. And then come <laughs> back and go, oh, my God, that's crazy. Yeah, but now you can make a movie of it. <laughs> you know, instead, what you said, there's this sort of half ass attempt to do synergy, but all it is is like make them look like the movies. It's not really yeah. synergy. So, I don't know. This is above my pay grade. I'm not a news <laughs> officer. You know, oh. who the hell knows what their decision making process is, but it's definitely the wrong one. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. Yeah, it definitely is. But yeah, I, I thank you so freaking oh, much. Whatever. This was amazing. You guys are awesome. I love your channel. I love your little group things. I I, I, I don't quite understand your obsession with Depp and Heard, but that is, <laughs> that, that's your own trip, lady. Um, but yeah, it's great. I, I, I'm trying to interact with as many cool people as I can. I I appreciate it. I this like honestly, this has been so great. And you're so like there's been a couple of times I've had people on and it's been like pulling teeth, but this. <laughs> this is what I, this after after all this crazy week. I'm so